My name is Greg Satharis. I'm the chair of the math department at Bristol Community College, and we're I'm also on the multicultural committee. So we're very happy uh, to have Dr. Phil Scalisi, who's the chair of the math department at Bridgewater State University. Uh, Phil has spent uh, much of his time uh, traveling around the world when he's on vacations and other such, and he's always looking at the history of mathematics in the different areas where he is visiting. Uh, he has a renowned collection of artifacts, uh, which is on display or is going to be on display in the new science building. If you've been up to Bridgewater State recently, they have a beautiful state-of-the-art uh, facility, which is going to house uh, uh, Phil's collection. Uh, and we have him here today to talk to you about the history of mathematics of non-Western origins. Professor Scalisi. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> well, be the, I'll be talking about the history of mathematics uh, really worldwide. Uh, in my capacity as, a, as chair of the department, and plus the, uh, the organizations that I belong to that, that specialize in history of mathematics, I've been able to do quite a bit of traveling. And uh, uh, North, South America, every, every uh, continent, China, Tibet, all over. So in all the geographical places that I've been, I do try to investigate the history of mathematics, how mathematics has developed over the centuries, actually over the millennia, okay? And one in particular that has gotten quite a bit of notoriety uh, is this. Let me just uh, put this on. Recognize that date? No? Yeah, that's right. The end of days, the end of the world is on that date. The Mayans predicted it. Are you concerned? Are you worried? Okay. No, no need to be whatsoever. But this is, uh, you know, all we had to have is that the media and Hollywood uh, latched on to this, and so uh, they made movies. In fact, I think there was a movie just entitled 2012. And uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it comes about because of the, the ancient Mayan uh, civilization of Mesoamerica. The ancient Mayans uh, have a long history. Uh, they're probably the single most important Native American group as far as math and science is concerned in the entire Americas, North, South, Central. The geographical uh, region over which the Mayans <coughs> lived would be that Yucatan Peninsula, you know, that juts out into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and then it comes in to the uh, four most eastern states of Mexico, plus Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, El Salvador, and that was the, uh, the geographical region. Their culture goes all the way back uh, to the fourth, century, fourth millennium BC, but their heyday, so to speak, is, uh, took place during the third to the ninth centuries AD. That's the so-called classic period, as archaeologists like to refer to them as that. Well, the, the Mayans, as I had mentioned, um, were extremely, extremely sophisticated as far as their mathematics and their science is concerned. Uh, their astronomy was first rate. They were able to record eclipses, uh, the transits of the various planets, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and so forth. Uh, they used that uh, especially for their everyday life, if you can believe it. Because they were really much interested in um, developing their own agricultural uh, concepts, the development of crops. Their main crop was, uh, was maize, you know, like corn. So they were always interested in a cyclical uh, concept. When they had to plant, then they had to gather, <coughs> excuse me, then they had to clear, and then the cycle just kept going on and on and on, uh, over and over. So the Mayans had developed uh, a calendar, by far the most advanced calendar in the New World. And in fact, not only just one calendar, but four different calendars. And each calendar had its own application, okay? Now, the, the so-called Hab calendar that the Mayans use 
consisted of a year of 360 days. Not 365, 360 days. Not that they didn't know about 365.24, all right? They did know about that. But, but to get it aligned with their planting uh, cycle seasons, they had to use 360, okay? And uh, the, f the extra five days to them were considered unlucky days. Those are the days that uh, they all stayed inside their little huts, never ventured out because bad luck, bad things are going to happen to them, okay? But that number, 360, played a very important role. It's 18 times 20. 18 times 20, keep that in mind. Uh, let me just uh, show a few more things here. That date that I gave you uh, has never been inscribed, written down on any ancient Mayan artifact. And yet, it's so important. People, people you know, uh, have thought that this date was very, very important. There was only one artifact that was ever found that has that one date of December 21st, 2012. And this is the so-called <coughs> uh, Tortuguero Monument Number 6. And that's what it looks like, okay? So there it is. You can see the date. <laughs> the date is, <coughs> do you see these dots right here? And then these dots right here? And then these, these they're, they're like strange looking faces? Yeah. Right. That represents a date. And if you do something about Mayan hieroglyphics, you're able to decipher that. And that date refers to the December 21st, uh, 2012. <clears throat> Why that was important to the Mayans is because that uh, it represent, represented the end of a cycle. The, in, in order to fully understand that, you needed to know something about the Mayan civilization, their religion. They, had a, they worshipped a pantheon of uh, gods, okay? <clears throat> and certain numbers meant more to them than others. One number was nine, another number was 13 especially 13. And the end of the cycle uh, is what to, they, to them were called uh, the, the 13 baktun. That's the word that they used. But it represented to them the end of days, the end of the cycle. And uh, when we use the words end of days, to them, what was going to happen? So that when you go to December 22nd, what were they going to find? Nothing. They were just, it was just going to be what? The creation of a new cycle. It was going to just get started. Now, there are people that are alarmists. There are people that tend to philosophize. There are people who have given all sorts of uh, interpretations. But <coughs> the minds themselves felt that the new cycle to begin was going to show an age of enlightenment. People are going to get along. No wars, nothing like that. Every, everything was going to be in harmony and in peace. Nice thoughts. Probably not going to happen, unfortunately. Now, <clears throat> when we study uh, the Mayan uh, numeration system, all right, uh, then because they, their numeration system was a vigesimal system, vigesimal simply means it's a base 20. When we write down our numbers, Today, our numbers are written in base 10, or decimal system, all right? So if I write down 3114 like that, all right, you know exactly what that means. And you can expand it into powers of 10. The Mayans did not use that. They used a base 20 system of numeration, 20, all right? Um, why? Okay, that again is up to interpretation, but, uh, but it, it probably went along with the fact that uh, as far as developing numeration systems by different cultures, usually either the base of 10 was used, the base of 5 was used, we call it a quinary system, the base of 15 was used, cause, called the quinary decimal, or a base 20. And why do you think those numbers were used by any civilization, any culture? 
5, 10, 15, 20. That's, a, that's how, yes, good. That's how people began to count with their fingers and toes. All right, so it's, it's no surprise that uh, different civilizations, different cultures made use of those as bases. So base 20 is, is what the Mayans used. Unfortunately, and this was what, what made it difficult to translate, to decipher their writings, okay? These are hieroglyphs. Now, you probably used, you heard the word hieroglyph mainly in associating with Egyptian, uh, the ancient Egyptians. Well, the same word, the same term can be used here. A glyph is nothing but a picture, all right? And because a number of the writings of the Mayans were, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, associated to religious concept, uh, we use the word hiero. Hiero just means sacred or religious. So that's what, uh, uh, where the word hieroglyphic comes from. So what did people do then? How, do, how were they able to decipher their numbers in particular? Okay, base 20. So if the base is 20, then the digits, the, the numbers that you put in any individual position would have to range between 0 and 19. Okay, you got 20 digits. Just like base 10, what we use today, any individual number for any numeral would have to range between what? 0 and 9, as you know. But this is base 20, so it has to go between 0 and 19. So they needed 20 different glyphs, 20 different symbols, in order to uh, uh, write out any integer. Okay? So, this is a, uh, just a little chart to indicate the glyphs that they used, starting with 0. Whoops. Starting with 0, right there. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And that's it. All they, they, knew, they knew they needed 20 uh, symbols, but to make life a little bit simpler, they only used three distinct symbols. One for a zero, one for the number one, a dot, and one for the number five, uh, a horizontal bar. Then everything else beyond that, up to 19, was just additive. So if you wanted the number seven, it would be two dots over a bar. If you wanted the number 16, it would be a single dot over three bars. Okay, so <clears throat> it's very easy to look at uh, uh, interpreting the digits of a, of a Mayan numeral. The thing that I want to impress is this, the zero symbol. You see that, that oval shaped thing? Sort of looks like a shell, could be an eye. I've seen a number of different variants on it. It just depended on who the scribe was, the person that was doing the writing, or doing the incisions on, in stone or what have you. And uh, that's important <coughs> because that zero symbol is the oldest symbol for, used for the number zero in the entire history of mankind. In all of uh, pre-recorded uh, you know, history, the symbol for zero, and zero plays a very important role when you write out your numerals. Why? Well, for a number of reasons, but one is that it indicates to you where that particular power is missing. All right? So the, uh, uh, that symbol was used by the Mayans. Now, that isn't to say that the concept of the number zero uh, was not used earlier than them, uh, because it was. And we'll see that when we move over to Mesopotamia and Babylonia. <laughs> but as far as an actual symbol is concerned, it was this, given by the Mayans. Now, very strange things happen here. When they wrote their numerals, instead of us writing a number like 5012, the way we would write it, they wrote their numerals vertically instead of horizontally. So you could put 5 here, 0 there, 1 here, or 2 here, or inverted. But it was written, they were written vertically. <coughs> so if you look at uh, 20, which is the base, all right, it would be the one symbol over the zero symbol, all right? And that would represent, the way you interpret that would be one times 20 plus zero. So that would give you the number 20. But notice, one, zero. Isn't that the way we write the base for our enumeration system, for base 10? How do you write 10? One, zero. And that's exactly how it's used there. 
So if you want to go, say, to 24, for example, over here, it would be 1 times 20, and then you add the 4. So you get the number 24. All right. Anyway, <coughs> that's, that's fairly simple as far as those small numbers are concerned. However, you can look at this. Right, right here, you have a vertical numeral. So if you saw that, on a particular ancient Mayan artifact, all right? How do, how do you translate such a thing like that? Well, normally, for any base 20, all right, this would be the, the highest power. Notice it's four digits. This would be the ones position or the units. This would be the, what normally would correspond to the tens position. That would be the twenties position. This would normally correspond to the 20 squared or hundreds position, the way we would use it. But to them, it's not 20 squared, which is 400. No, it's this. It's 18 times 20, which is 360. And then this top one here is not 20 cubed, but rather 7200, which is 18 times uh, 20 squared. So they say, that seems kind of strange to do that. And why did they do that? Again, some different interpretations, but generally the accepted thing is it's this 360 here. <coughs> they wanted to align their numeration system to <coughs> get, come up with multiples of, say, 360, not 365. All right? I mean, not multiples of 400, excuse me which would be 20 squared. So what they did was they always took one factor of 20 and replaced it by an 18. That's essentially what's happened. So if you see this numeral right here, the bottom one would be 15. Then you go 8 times 20, as it says. Add to that, this is 17 times a 360. Add to that the 1 times 7,200. OK? And so th there it is right there, and that comes out to be 13,495. Well, you can imagine that archaeologists, anthropologists, math historians had a tough time trying to translate these things. Okay? And, <coughs> and one of the reasons is that we, because they wrote these things vertically, where do you see them? What kind of artifacts do you see? Well, they would write uh, or incise into stone, stone pillars like their dates. And uh, sometimes if the scribe isn't too careful and uh, starts to run out of room, what would happen is these symbols would start to get squished together. <coughs> so <coughs> if you had like a dot, a bar, and a bar, and a bar, you might think that that's 16. Or, because if it's one digit, but that may not be the proper interpretation. It might be two digits, a bar, I mean, a dot over a bar, and then the other two bar represented the, another digit, all right? So there are different possible interpretations. That's what made it difficult to translate these things. And the entire decipherment of Mayan glyphs uh, really didn't take place into until the early part of the 20th century. There's over 700 different glyphs that have been observed in different artifacts. We only know how to translate about 400 of them right now. So there's still work to be done. As far as the mathematics is concerned, that isn't really too much of a problem. Um, now, <coughs> this term, the long count, that's the one that's associated with the, the end of day's date. All right? That's the one, this is the long count that determines the end of the cycle, and at the same time, the beginning of the cycle, the creation of days as opposed to the end of days. And notice, it, here's your zero, the one, four, five, eleven, etc. Get all the way over to here, one, two, three, four, five digits long. All right? So zero plus, what's that? Four times 20, all right? plus 0 times 18 times 20, which is 360, plus 10 times uh, 7,200, plus 9 times 144,000. If you add all those up, you'll get that number. And that number is in terms of days. 
So, if you knew when their uh, creation date was, all right, then you could determine that date, December 21st, 2012. I always give that as an as a, a exercise problem in my history of math students. But just wanted to indicate to you that this long count is just yet another way of measuring time uh, by the Mayans. And there it is. August 11, 3114 BC. That's the beginning of time. So if you know that date, all right, then you use a 130000, calculate the number of days, add that to that, and you come up with December 21st, 2012. Why was that date chosen, though? And I've had many, many uh, uh, <coughs> conversations with uh, the math historians, especially the Mayan archae archaeological uh, experts on that which, by the way, is at the University of Texas at Austin. Meyer uh, Center is there. And uh, they don't know. They don't know why the mines themselves use that particular date. All right? We don't even know <coughs> how that particular date came about, except that we know that that's the correct date from looking at different artifacts. So that's the, uh, uh, the Mayan system. Now, how do we know anything about, about all the, these uh, glyphs and so forth? Especially because they go back to that fourth millennium BC. But as I said, the main uh, period was from the third to the ninth centuries uh, AD. Well, one particular artifact, very famous, it's called the Dresden Codex, because it's uh, preserved in Dresden, Germany. And uh, it looks like that. Now, that is just a portion of the codex. The word codex just refers to, it's analogous to our modern day concept of a book. That's all. And uh, the codex, you notice these folds right here? This is really all connected, but they're folded just much like a road map. You know, when you have a road map with an accordion style uh, map like that. And what the Mayans did was to uh, <coughs> write on each of these folds and on the reverse side as well. So this is about a foot tall. And you notice right here, you see all of these numerals, see all the dots and the bars and so forth. We can translate those. And those refer to the transits of, of the planet Venus. Uh, <coughs> and it just goes on and on and on. It's really a remarkable uh, uh, artifact. Most of our knowledge about Mayan mathematics stems from this particular codex. Um, in existence today, there are four, only four codices uh, that have come down to us that have been preserved. One is preserved here in Dresden. Another one's preserved at the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in Paris another one in Madrid, and a fourth one in New York City, okay? But the best one is this uh, Dresden Codex. The Mayans, however, they created literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these codices, all right? And yet we only have four. Why? What happened? How come we only have four uh, that, have, <laughs> that have been preserved? Unfortunately, what has happened is that <coughs> that whole area, after the, uh, uh, the Columbus voyages, the Spaniards came and, uh, in a sense, colonized that whole area. So here we have the conquistadores come. The bishop, the fir very first bishop of the Yucatan was a man by the name of Diego de Landa. And he was responsible for one very important event. He, he saw all of this writing that was written on these various codices, and then he said to himself, and I'm quoting him, these are the markings of the devil. So, what did he do? He called for what we today call an out of the faith. He just asked all of his soldiers and so forth to gather up as many of these codices as possible, including their ceramics, all right, brought them all together in one big giant pile, and then 
tremendous fire, just destroyed them all, which is unfortunate. Here, here we have you know one man uh, determining the fate of a complete culture, and uh, it's fortunate that we do have these four uh, in the still preserved. Now, I've traveled throughout all the jungles down there. I spent about a month with, with some of the, the modern day uh, Mayans. But this one you probably recognize, I would think. This particular temple, this uh, uh, is a temple pyramid as we call it, uh, because it's in the shape of a, of a, excuse me, of a right square pyramid, but it doesn't come to an apex, to a point. It's locked off at the top, so you have this plain uh, uh, surface. Then, on top of that, you have, right here, this temple, okay? And that's where they conducted different their business, mostly religiously uh, <coughs> oriented. But this particular uh, uh, of, uh, pyramid is located at Chichen Itza. Uh, it has a name, it's referred to El Castillo, which means the castle. But the Mayans, this was just not put together haphazardly, so to speak. There was some thought behind this. It's, it's really interesting. If you count up these steps here, all right, there's uh, not these steps right here, but these right here, these levels, there's nine of them. <coughs> and, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, there's 91 of them, these right here. These, these are the ones I really want. 91 of them, and there's one on each of the four faces. So if you have 91, each of the four faces, that's 364. Then you consider the top level, and that gives you 365. All right? That was on purpose. A lot of things uh, with the El uh, Castillo. Another thing is the solstices. The <coughs> at the uh, um, spring and autumn solstices, solstices the, uh, the sun would play tricks on this. And uh, you could see that at the, when the sun was beginning to set, you'd get a, 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 a shadow effect. And that shadow would start up here and then work its way down all the way to the bottom in a series of like triangles. And right over here, I don't know if you can see it, is the head of a serpent. All right. This was the temple of Kukulkan, which was uh, one of their deities. And uh, it's an amazing sight to behold. When the sun sets, this starts and it goes like this, and then it culminates in that head. So it's, it's as though that serpent is moving. The other solstice, what happens is, on the other side, it moves up instead of coming down. And uh, so uh, that's just one um, thing that they planned on that as well. Uh, but there are many other mathematically related uh, uh, concepts with this particular temple. There's well over, well, well over maybe 4,000 archaeological sites that are still yet to be uncovered that are Mayan. <coughs> now, moving over to Egypt. Uh, of course, you recognize that, that guy. Which is, by the way, truly magnificent. If you haven't seen it in purpose, it, it, in person, it's a uh, hmm? the Fury Mass of Tutankhamun. It is preserved at the uh, uh, the Cairo uh, Museum. And this, just to give you an idea geographically uh, of uh, the ancient Egyptian region, which starts up here. Uh, at the Nile Delta, and notice Alexandria, Rosetta, and then Cairo is over here. And on the West Bank is the pyramids of Giza and the pyramids of Saqqara. And the Nile just keeps going all the way down through Luxor, Edfu, Aswan, all the way down to Abu Simbel. And uh, to go from Cairo down here, we had to fly to get there. Uh, it's quite a quite a distance, <coughs> but this this site at, at Aswan 
and Sakar and Gies and Rosetta and Alexandria, those are probably the most important um, uh, cities uh, that uh, we can talk about as far as ancient, ancient Egypt is concerned. Okay, Alexandria, a magnificent city, really beautiful city, is, uh, uh, overlooks the Mediterranean. And uh, it's named after Alexander the Great. Okay, this was his city, so to speak, because even though this was all Egyptian, uh, Alexander, of course, went crazy, started to conquer all the Mediterranean lands, and uh, including northern Africa here in Egypt. And his city was, the city was named after him. Okay, the, uh, this is the oldest artifact that we have that contains numbers, ancient Egyptian numbers. It's called the Oxford Mace. Okay, why? Because it's preserved at uh, Oxford University in, in, in England. All right, it dates to about 3250 BC. It's the Oxford Mace. Um, can you see right here this figure? That's the figure of the king. Do you see right here? I don't know if you can make that out. It's right, right here. It's the figure of a scorpion. And this particular king at this time was often referred to as the scorpion king. Okay? Uh, and so this is extremely early. This is actually pre-dynastic when they begin to uh, study ancient Egyptian chronology. So it goes back to 3000 BC. But what is so important about it is, as I said, inscribed on it, these, only a portion of it has been preserved. <coughs> but if you uh, turn it around, look at the, the symbols that they used, all right, this is what it recorded. That number of prisoners, that number of oxen, that number of goats, all the spoils of a particular war or battle of some type. All right? But they were written in, of course, their ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic symbols. Now, the reason, of course, why we were able to decipher the, uh, the symbols that were used uh, by the ancient Egyptians is because of this, the so-called Rosetta Stone. You familiar with that? All right. It is, uh, of course, this, this stone right here. It's preserved now in the British Museum. Uh, the reason it's called the Rosetta Stone is because that's where the stone was uh, found at the little town of Rosetta in northern Egypt near Alexandria. I think the name now is Rashid, that, the little town of Rosetta. But what happened, <coughs> if you don't know the the, the details, which we go over very quickly, is that during Napoleon's uh, wanderings around uh, the Mediterranean, his, his uh, uh, ideas of trying to conquer all of the, the lands around there, well, he was trying to uh, uh, occupy completely Egypt, northern Egypt, and some of his soldiers around 1797 to 1799 were stationed at Rashid, at, at Rosetta. And uh, they were excavating to build a fort there. What did they find? They found this, the Rosetta Stone. Uh, they figured that, well, it seems like this should be, have some significance to it. So they brought it back to the French Egyptologist that was stationed in Cairo. And <coughs> they began to work on it. And then it was brought back, okay, not to Paris. By the way, the Parisians loved to have this. No, they're not going to get it. The British aren't going to give it up. So would the Egyptians want to get this back? But they're not going to get it either. So uh, uh, it was uh, copies of this thing were made, and various people worked on it. Okay, one was a man by the name of Young in England, but the most important man here was a, a Frenchman by the name of Champollion. And this stone, if you would look at it close up it would be broken up into three sections. One section has script which was written in archaic Greek. Another section uh, was written uh, in a more popular uh, ancient language, Egyptian language called Demotic. And then another script, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was in hieroglyphics. So, 
what did they do? They went on the supposition that what was written in each section was exactly the same story. And so they had to make comparisons. But this is only a portion of the existing stone. The, the other parts are missing. So it took a long time. And in comparison with other artifacts, eventually the, 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 the decipherment uh, did occur in the 1820s. And this is the man, Champollion, in France. And he published his results in 1822. And this is the, uh, the title page of that that uh, book. But that just started it. And so the full decipherment really didn't uh, take place until the latter part of the 19th century. Today, well known. If you want, you can take a course in just Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, there's grammars that have been published, <coughs> dictionaries, and so forth and so on. Now, as far as the hieroglyphs themselves, as far as mathematics is concerned, these are the basic symbols. Now, because they glyphs, they're pictures. And uh, you see what they are. Well, OK. Right here is the number 1, 10, 100, 1,000. All right, 10,000, 100,000, and a million. So they're what? Powers of 10. So just like what we use, they did have a base 10, a decimal system of numeration. However, the big difference is there was no concept of a place value or a position. So if you had a number like 315 and you took the same numbers and permuted them and say 513, well, obviously they're different numbers for us because the, posi the relative position is important. In a base 10 uh, system like they used, not important. You get exactly the same value, all right, because it was completely additive. So they had these uh, symbols. The one represented a staff, a walking stick. The 10 represented an arch. Some people just refer to it as an arch, or the heel one, which is, of course, arch C. This was a scroll. And it's a, a, meant to represent a papyrus scroll. It's as though you took a piece of paper and just rolled it up and looked at it on end. That's what you would, what you would get. This is a lotus flower, all right, which is very, very prolific all along the Nile. And this <coughs> was a, a finger bent. That's what it was meant to be. And this is a fish, a little fish, almost like a tadpole. They call it a bulldog fish. And then this right here, this uh, figure with the arms raised, was often referred to as a man in astonishment. A man in astonishment. It's always also been referred to as the god of the unending, or the god of the infinite. Okay? And that, that's it. Those are the only symbols they use, for the most part now. Okay? And uh, so if you wanted to write a number, <coughs> you know, like 524, what you would do is take five of these uh, papyrus scrolls, just put them next to each other. Uh, 20 would be two of these guys and four of those. And just put them in a group. And it makes no difference where you put those symbols because it's commutative. It doesn't make any difference. It's completely additive. Just add the value. And that would give you any positive integer. <coughs> However, obviously they needed to know how to uh, uh, calculate fractions, how to be able to write fractions. And uh, one, uh, the way that they did it was like if you wanted the number just 249, 249, well, there's the 200, there's the 40, and there's the 9. But to distinguish that from an integer, then they introduced one more symbol, this oval-shaped symbol. And that meant to reciprocate, take the reciprocal of that integer. So that would represent one over the number 249. So no matter what the number was, if you want one over it, uh, just put the group that indicate the integer and then put this little oval. They didn't make one big oval that went over the whole thing, unless it was small. <coughs> Usually they put it on top and to the, and to the right. Okay. Now. 
Here's another thing. Not only did they use hieroglyphics, but they also used another script, which was called hieratic. And you notice that that stem again, hiero. All right. <coughs> the reason why this kind of script was used was that in writing hieroglyphics, you're actually drawing pictures. And that took time to do that. The hieratic was a cursive type of script. You could write out your, your script, your text, uh, your numerals much quicker once you understood these little uh, squiggles here and lines and so forth. But those are your so-called hieratic numerals. Most of the existing papyrus artifacts that we have that are numerical uh, are written not in hieroglyphs, actually, but in hieratic. Some will have both scripts on the same, uh, <coughs> on the same uh, uh, artifact. Now, how do we know anything about the mathematics of the, uh, of the ancient Egyptians? Mainly because of certain papyrus scrolls that are in existence today. One of which is preserved in Moscow in Russia. Hence, it's the Moscow papyrus. And notice it dates to 1890 BC. Okay? And that's a section of it. That's what it looks like. Now, this top part here shows the geometrical figure. All this is hieratic. That's all hieratic script. Down here shows the transliteration into hieroglyphics. So here you have the hieroglyphs. This just reproduces that figure. And then these are numerals. These are all numerals right here. What do they mean? What is the figure? That figure is just a, a, a as if you took a pyramid, all right, cut it off, lop it off at the top, and then cut a plane through it like that. So you would get a, a, uh, uh, <coughs> a figure that would look like that. Well, on this papyrus is this particular problem. What does it say? It says that. If you're told a truncated pyramid of six for the height, vertical height, four on the base, etc., 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 it gives you all this set of instructions, all right? And then at the end, you come down here, it says you have to take 28 twice, result 56, see it's 56, you'll find it right. <laughs> Boom. And there it is. So it's one of these where they give you the answer, and you've got to come up with the question. It's like an ancient Jeopardy type thing. <laughs> here you have it. Well, <coughs> it turns out that, that all those uh, uh, directions, those commands with those numbers, appear right here. These, this, this, and then at the end you will get this result here. And uh, what we have here, what is it, what is it that's being calculated? When it says, see it's, uh, it's 56, you'll find it right. What is 56? What does it have to do with this particular pyramid? Well, a pyramid that has the top lopped off like that is called a frustum from geometry. It's calculating the volume of that pyramid. And if you go through this sequence of commands, it follows a formula. A nice, nice formula that is, will always calculate for you the volume of the first of the square pyramid. <clears throat> this is the only example of the use of that formula in the ancient world prior to 600 BC. It's the only example uh, uh, that uh, we have that. So they obviously knew the formula. They didn't derive it or anything like that, but it was correct. We know it is. Today we do because we can actually derive that formula. There's only 25 problems on this papyrus. However, this is it. This is, this is the, uh, the magnum opus of all the uh, Egyptian papyri. It's called the Rhine papyrus and that dates to 1650 B.C. <coughs> and uh, it consists of a papyrus all rolled up, but it's about 13 inches tall. And then if you unravel it, all right, unroll it, it goes out 18 feet. And it's written completely on the back and on the front uh, of that. And it's broken up into different sections here, do you see? And over here, like this. And these just represent different problems. There's well over 70, it's about 82 problems, I believe, 
that's uh, uh, written upon in this Rhine papyrus. It was named after Henry Rhine, who was a Scottish Egyptologist who had discovered it in, <coughs> in a bazaar in Cairo back in the 1880s. Uh, <coughs> bought it, brought it back. It's, where is it now? <coughs> it's in the British Museum, like practically everything else is. Okay? And people have studied this intensely. And the, the types of problems that are on this uh, are incredible. Uh, most of them deal with geometrical problems. Um, a lot of them deal with <coughs> areas, volumes, calculations, things like that. These are just some geometrical problems on, on this uh, papyrus. Okay, and it is, it's really quite a beautiful thing, just from an artistic point of view uh, as well, because it's, it's written with uh, black, red, sometimes blue, uh, different colored pigments. <coughs> so it's still uh, quite uh, studied right up to the present day. In this Rhine papyrus, you will see a table. Now, what I did was just <coughs> work out a, a, a complete translation of the table. All you are interested in is this column right here that says number, and this column at the end there. And what that is, is to look at how did the Egyptians write their fractions. I mean, you can see how they do the integers by using those, uh, those powers of 10 symbols, all right? <coughs> but what if they needed one over that? Well, you saw, you just put that little oval, and that would give you one over n, or whatever that is. Well, then what happens if you needed a fraction like 2 over n? You know, like 2 sevenths. Well, try to write that in terms of 1 over n. Those numbers were called unit, uh, Egyptian fractions in their honor. But if, if I ask you, how would you write 2 over 7 as a sum of two unit fractions? One over something plus one over something. Well, you could say, how about one seventh over one, uh, plus one seventh? True. No. They wouldn't use that. What they wanted is to write it as a sum of two different unit fractions. So if I gave that problem to you, two sevenths, and I said, can you write that as one over something and into the plus one over something? And that's an arithmetic problem. Could you do it? A big silence. <laughs> yeah, no, I bet you you wouldn't. But look, here's seven right here. If you go all the way over, look what you get. Yeah, that's what that is. Two over seven is really one fourth plus one over twenty-eight. How would you ever come up with something like that? Again, the Egyptians. Their calculus of fractions, just manipulating them with fractions, was amazing. All right? And you notice some of these. Look at this. See, like this one here is a sum of three different unit fractions. This one here is a sum of four different unit fractions. And <coughs> it goes on. I just continued this. And it goes up to 101. So all of the answers are in sums of twos or three or four terms, but no more than that. But there's another question, well, why? If you could do it in two, why would you want to do it in three or four? Because there are algebraic formulas that will allow you to do it always in just two. Uh, that's, that's something that has undergone quite a bit of debate. We don't really know the reason for that. <coughs> Uh, while I was in Karnak, I, I took a few pictures here, only because, you see these symbols? Numbers. Yeah, those are numbers. Okay? Just, just as an example of actually seeing uh, the numbers incised into the pillars. Now, Saqqara is the oldest man-made existing uh, edifice, building, uh, in the entire history of the world. Okay, as far as recorded history is concerned. And right there is this uh, uh, pyramid. It's called the Stepped Pyramid for obvious reasons. Okay? <coughs> and uh, it's still undergoing today uh, excavations as well. This uh, 
uh, this pyramid um, is not open to the general public all the time. Uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, uh, get permission to go in here. And uh, at Saqqara, you have, and this was just built, uh, the Imhotep Museum. And the Imhotep Museum, it's named Imhotep after Imhotep, who was uh, <coughs> the great, ancient, great uh, Egyptian architect, scientist, mathematician, etc. One of the oldest there is. In fact, we're not even sure if he really existed. <laughs> he might be a complete legend. It's not clear. Um, but inside there, you'll see this, and this is supposed to be Imhotep himself. Now, in there, it's interesting to note that they have these particular um, stone <coughs> rods. And these are referred to as royal cubits. Okay? And a cubit is just a, 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 <coughs> excuse me, a unit of measurement. And different cultures that uh, change. Generally speaking, it was like from the elbow to the tip of the finger. All right? This. Uh, each of these were their measuring sticks. That's how they would actually use these things to, to lay off uh, their segments. Very few of these have survived, but a few of these are preserved here at uh, Saqqara. Okay, now, the great, uh, as far as mathematics is concerned, uh, a great school of mathematics uh, had flourished was created and flourished at Alexandria in Egypt. Okay? Prior to that, the center of mathematics was really in, in Greece. And, uh, and then it moved over to Alexandria about the uh, fourth uh, century BC. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's where was founded a, a magnificent library. It goes under various names, a library, a museum, research institution, it was all that combined. It was like a college, university, library, museum, all rolled up into one. Magnificent. At one time, it was boasted to contain over 700,000 papyrus scrolls. All right? Unfortunately, fires uh, destroyed most of them. Over the years, there's been four separate occasions of fires uh, uh, that uh, destroyed the library in Alexandria. And then recently, most recently, uh, when I was there, this Bibliotheca Alexandrina was created. And that's the facade, the outside of it now. It is absolutely beautiful. It's a state-of-the-art museum. And uh, in there as well is a wonderful collection of early scientific books, especially mathematical books, most of which go back into the <coughs> over a thousand years. So prior to 1440, of course, they're all manuscript, because then in 1440 you had the invention of movable type, so you actually had printed uh, books. But uh, this is uh, the new library at Alexandria. And uh, <coughs> this is just uh, an example of a geometry text and the author uh, of that right here and so forth. And it's just magnificently laid out. Uh, all of the great famous names are represented in this uh, library. The very first Alexandrian mathematician of any note was Euclid, the great Euclid. And that's just an old represent, uh, representation uh, of supposedly what he looked like. You can't, of course, know for sure. But this is <coughs> the elements of Euclid. And that book was the basis for most of our modern day geometry, the way we study it uh, in junior high school or middle school or elementary school. I don't know where you study that elementary stuff. There. <coughs> and this was the elements of Euclid. The, uh, that book has gone over its claim well over a thousand different editions over the years. So it is the all-time bestseller. All time, with the exception of one book, the Bible. Right. Other than the Bible, this is it. And uh, uh, the way Euclid had laid out his thoughts logically for, uh, for dealing with mathematics and techniques of proof and so forth uh, is all laid out beautifully in his elements. The greatest mathematician of antiquity 
was Archimedes. Now, Archimedes was uh, uh, born, grew up in uh, Syracuse, which is on the eastern end of the island of Sicily. So he was a Sicilian, but at that time it was Greek. So he was a Greek Sicilian. And uh, <coughs> he had spent a lot of his time, his studies, in Alexandria. So we consider him as an Alexandrian mathematician. All right? Archimedes did the most advanced work of anybody uh, uh, in this early period. He was doing things in what we would today w would refer to as the calculus, both the differential and the integral calculus. If we had to write a history of the calculus, we'd have to start all the way back here with, uh, with Archimedes. And he's been honored in so many different ways. I mean, here's a, here's a stamp, an Italian stamp, and it shows here the so-called screw of Archimedes to raise water. And so one of his many uh, inventions, this <coughs> is an example of a mosaic. And it's an ancient one. It shows Archimedes here working on some mathematical problem. And this is a Roman soldier. And uh, the legend has it that at that, uh, during the Roman siege of, of uh, Sicily, especially at Syracuse, 212 BC, that's when it occurred, um, this Roman soldier was instructed to capture, uh, uh, take Archimedes as a prisoner. Archimedes told the soldier, get lost, I'm working on a problem. Well, the soldier didn't take too kindly to that, and just did away with Archimedes, killed him. Um, so eventually, there was supposed to be a, a, a headstone. Uh, people claim they know where uh, Archimedes was buried, where the headstone is. It's completely lost now. Although one of my cousins back in Sicily, he knows exactly where this thing is. <laughs> Every time I go over there, I always wind up in jail. The reason being is because we're on private property, so I said, no more. That's it. Archimedes is gone forever. Eratosthenes, that's him, supposedly. And we know Eratosthenes for two things. One is that he was a number theorist, and he had de developed a technique, a procedure, called the sieve of Eratosthenes that allowed people to calculate uh, prime numbers, those numbers that are divisible only by themselves in the number one. Okay? And <coughs> um, it's a long process for large numbers, but still, it was one of the first early, really the earliest attempt at trying to determine when numbers were prime or not. But he's more famous for this, this right here. And uh, this is just a cross-section of what we have here. Syene is now Aswan. Alexandria is up here. And so he was the very first person to measure accurately the circumference of the Earth. Now, the, the figure we generally associate with that is 25,000 miles. All right? He did it. He came very, it was very, very accurate. And the way he did it was by shadow measurements. Placing a stick in the ground at Alexandria, placing a stick in the ground at Syene, and at noontime, a shadow was cast on one, no shadow was cast on the other. And then geometrically, you just extend those back to the center of the earth, that angle of the shadow was measured. They could do that, it was 1 50th of that. <coughs> of a uh, full 360-degree uh, rotation uh, and set up a, a, just a little um, a ratio. And when you solve, you come up with 250,000 stadia. A stadium is one-tenth of a mile, so it comes out to 25,000 miles. It's a very, it's a really, really quite, quite simple and uh, ingenious. Apollonius was another Alexandrian mathematician and that's him there, again. But he was famous for the conic sections. All right? And that's what they look like. You get a, a double cone like that, you just take a plane and just slice the cones at various orientations. In one case, you'll get a circle. If you just orient it a little bit, you'll get an ellipse. All right? If you orient it so it cuts just one cone, you'll get a parabola. And then if uh, it cuts both cones, you're going to get a hyperbola. Those are the so-called conic sections. 
And he was able to get all the modern uh, equivalences of the equations of the conic sections. And of course, they appear everywhere, especially in astronomy as well, in physics. Hero, all right, sometimes known as Heron. All right, again, that's supposed to be him. We know him really for one thing, and that. That's the formula for the area of a triangle. You don't even have to know the angles. All you need to know are the three sides, A, B, C. Calculate what's called the semi-perimeter, A plus B plus C over 2. That's S, put it in there. Take that product, take the square root, and you get your answer. That's the so-called hero's formula for the area of the triangle. This man is very important, Diophantus. And uh, <coughs> uh, that's him up here. But this person is really the one that's uh, more meaningful. This man is Fermat, F-E-R-M-A-T, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, lived during the 17th century. And he had written a book, uh, Diophantus had written a book called The Arithmetica. That got translated into many different uh, European languages, including French. And so Fermat had used this book. This was the uh, 1821, uh, I mean 1621 uh, edition of the Diophantus' Arithmetica. And he brought that around with him everywhere he went. And, uh, and he would just put little notes in the margin and so forth and so on. He was a brilliant mathematician. Well, <laughs> one of the little uh, uh, notes, uh, one of the problems in it was x squared plus y squared equals z squared. All right? A square plus a square equals another square. All right. Now, you know that as the famous Pythagorean theorem, right? Well, it occurred to Fermat about, well, what happens if I looked at x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed? Are there any solutions to that? Or fourth power, etc. And it turns out that uh, he had written in the margin, and it still exists, by the way, of because uh, there were fairly large margins in this printed book, and he said there are no integer solutions for the power to be three or greater, uh, other than the zero 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 trivial solution. There aren't any, and he said, and I have quoting him, most assuredly found a wonderful proof of this result, but the margin is too narrow to contain. So do you believe him, or do you not believe him? I mean, given the stature of Fermat, uh, the general feeling is we feel that he really honestly thought he found the proof. All right? Chances are he didn't, the general proof. However, he did prove it for a very specific case, all right, which, which was interesting in its own right, but it could not be generalized to all others. And that remained uh, one of the holy grail problems in all of mathematics. All right, we called it Fermat's last theorem, or Fermat's great theorem. It wasn't a theorem, because nobody could prove it. Prizes, monetary prizes were offered. They couldn't do it. Until 1993. And this guy, Andrew Wiles, Cambridge University, now at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, proved it. Locked himself away for 10 years. Worked on it, didn't even tell his wife or family. <laughs> And here he is. Uh, however, then it had to undergo scrutiny, and other mathematicians found a uh, flaw. And so what happened? He renewed, got back, took care of the flaw. It's completely proven. It's about 120 pages long. But it's not. I only got three minutes. First great woman mathematician, Hypatia. Um, that's about all I'm going to say. Uh, no, no, she is the very first one. She made a lot of contributions, wrote a lot of books and so forth. Unfortunately, she was uh, uh, considered a pagan, all right, at that time, which was all Christian. And so she was uh, killed by a, a infuriated mob of the crazy husbands, unfortunately. So that was that. Ptolemy we can forget about. Pappus. 
was an Alexandrian. And the reason I put that is because he gave the generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. And uh, if you take any triangle and, and just draw any two parallelograms, then you can create a parallelogram equal to the sum of the areas of these two. So it's an interesting uh, pro uh, problem. Proclus, <coughs> and the reason I have him is because of this commentary. And in it appeared the very first history of mathematics. That's one of the reasons we know so much about uh, that early period. Okay. Now, I'll end it with this. The Dada Library at Alexandria. This was created somewhere near the, uh, the Great Library. And it still exists today. It's underground. I took these pictures when I was there. Let me show you the, what, what happens here. These niches are where they stored the scrolls, the papyrus scrolls. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As I entered this, a whole pile of people were running at it. I said, well, what's the matter? I said, Don't go in. So naturally I went in. <laughs> All right? I said, what? I can't, what can you imagine? And they just felt spooky. Do you see anything unusual about that picture that I took? The dots. The dots. All right? These things. Well, I come home. They were OK with my, with my digital camera. I developed it. Look what I got. And <coughs> I come to find out, people tell me, that these things are called orbs. And they're supposed to represent ghosts. Uh, and spirits. And life force. Is that what it is? I take the word for it. <laughs> so, so these life forces, or whatever you call them, are supposed to be there. But anyway, I thought it was just an interesting aside. All right. I'll cut it off here. Thank you very much. On your way up, two comments. One, if you enjoyed this and are looking for a math course, Math 125, which satisfies your requirement, can have some of these historical aspects.